Our next speaker is Michael Friend. He is a retired chief engineer for future platforms at Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Mike has been immersed in aircraft technology and configuration development since graduating from the University of Illinois in 1978. In 36 years of work at Boeing, Mike had parallel career paths in international technology development and airplane product development. Mike led pioneering international technology center developments in Indonesia, Russia, Spain, Germany, and the Middle East, and retired from Boeing in 2014 as a senior technology director in the Global Technology Group. He served as chief engineer in the product development group in Boeing Commercial, leading the concept development efforts for the 20XX project, which spawned airplane concepts, including the Sonic Cruiser, 787, 747 large cargo freighter, and the fuel cell demonstrator aircraft. Since retirement from Boeing, Mike has been a consultant working with a number of companies, including Faraday Aerospace, Zunim, Deharda Machinabau, and Mitsubishi Aircraft. He's a licensed commercial pilot with instrument, float plane, and glider ratings, and currently flies an ex-US Army Aranka L-16A named the Compass Rose. The title of his presentation is Balancing Optimism and Realism in Electric Aircraft Design. Please welcome Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this presentation goes back to uh, when I first became a, a young chief engineer at, at Boeing. And I consulted with one of the old uh, graybeards uh, to get some advice. And he said, you understand what your job is, of course. And I answered, well, to define the art of the possible for our bosses. And he said, no, that, that's only half of your job. The more important half of your job is to use the laws of physics to prove why certain things are not possible to your bosses. Because airplane companies are full of marketing executives and other people who are extremely enthusiastic about the future but don't understand how you have to be constrained by the laws of physics sometimes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that concept. Next one. Oh, I, I have a clicker here, okay. So what I'm going to cover today are a couple of things. I, I made this a fairly wide-ranging uh, presentation. But I want to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of uh, people ask me all the time, why is it you're so interested in electric aircraft? I mean, what, what's the deal here? Uh, I want to talk about what I see as a realistic viewpoint of the state of the art of battery development. Uh, I, I think there's been a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, improving uh, electric motor performance and improving airframe performance, but frankly, that's not what's important because uh, as uh, the CEO of Tesla says all the time, the problem is that the batteries really aren't very good. I'd like to talk about this concept of balancing optimism with realism. Uh, I think both of those concepts are really necessary and I've been coming to these uh, electric aircraft presentations for many years and quite often they're very heavy on the, uh, the optimism viewpoint. A lot of very enthusiastic, forward-looking people, and sometimes it doesn't get properly balanced with a little bit more realistic view of what might happen. And I'm going to present you with a, a few approaches to think about all of these uh, uh, issues. So the thing that really got me interested in electric airplanes was uh, was this. Uh, so why, you ask, is Boeing building little two-seat motor gliders with fuel cells in them? It, it had to do with the idea of future commercial aircraft maybe using hydrogen-powered fuel cells to provide power for the galleys, for entertainment systems, for the, the non-essential uh, electrical needs on the airplane. Typically, we take electrical power off the propulsion engines to do these things, and, and that reduces the efficiency of them. So my idea was, you know, we could do 10 years worth of paper studies and do some lab tests, or we could just go fly the thing. And we did that in very short order. So over the course of three years, we designed and built and certified this airplane. Uh, you'll notice in the pictures you see that uh, the word experimental is not written on the side of this airplane. And that's because it was certified by the Spanish authorities 
and we actually received the supplemental type certificate for this aircraft, which um, you know, makes it one of the first certified aircraft in the world. It, it worked very nicely, by the way. It was uh, completely trouble free. And it, it only had one attribute that I found a little bit annoying, and I'll talk about that later on, which is that it used a conventional uh, two-bladed general aviation propeller, and everyone expected, ah, an electric airplane, it's going to be silent. Well, actually, this airplane was really noisy, and it was because all of the noise came from the, the propeller integration on the airframe. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So the fundamentals, why are we all so interested in this? Uh, I hear a couple of reasons when I talk to people. A lot of it has to do efficient, with efficiency. We all know electric motors are very efficient compared to internal combustion engines. Uh, greed and quiet. Uh, we talk about uh, electric aircraft being kind of the envir environmentally preferred solution for the future. Um, Maintenance and reliability, there's something really marvelous about the simplicity of a well-designed electric aircraft. And uh, we have a lot of evidence from uh, commercial airplane programs like the 787 that, that gives you great advantages. And then what I think is quite important is because electric propulsion enables uh, aircraft configurations that might not be possible otherwise. This morning, uh, earlier, we heard a presentation about some of the vertical takeoff and landing configurations that had varying degrees of success in the past. A lot of those actually might have well been successful if electric power had been as mature as it is today. So let's take a look at some of these motivations. Uh, so let's talk about the pictures at the bottom. So the, that little blue airplane is the one I fly around. It was built in 1946. And I compare and contrast it on the right to uh, Pipistrel's wonderful uh, Alpha Electro airplane. And people ask me, well, Mike, why are you comparing this antique to this sleek modern electric aircraft? And the reason is because it tells you what the challenge is. Because even after all these years and with all that wonderful technology, that electric aircraft on the right can't even come close to matching the complete performance package of my antique. And that has to do with being able to put two people in it, to fly for two hours to someplace up on the San Juan Islands to have a, have a lunch, quickly refuel it, and, and come back home. And, and that's an important point, because a lot of the electric aircraft that we've seen flying are, are really great tools for moving the state of the art forward. But you have to think about it like the very first Tesla sports car. Think about that uh, 10, 15 years ago. Who was driving around in a Tesla sports car? Well, it was guys like George Clooney. It was, you know, well-intentioned, in environmentally conscious, rich people who wanted to make a point. And I think until that electric airplane on the right can match or exceed the performance of my tired old on antique on the left, it will simply be a stepping stone. It won't be a viable long-term product. And, and we need to keep that in mind when we're comparing different uh, electric airplane concepts. So I'm, I'm quite convinced that uh, it's only when we'll reach that tipping point that electric aircraft will move from being a novelty to being a sustainable business proposition. And I think we can see that happening right now with the Model 3 with Tesla. It's finally almost reached that tipping point. So why is this so hard? I mean, why, you know, we've been hearing for 15 years now about this terrific process, uh, progress in, in battery chemistry. Why is this still such a big deal? It's, it's because it's more than just the battery. Uh, you know, it has to do with the enclosure that the battery goes in, the battery management system, uh, the containment system, which gives you a safe and certifiable system. Um, and we can see uh, from the experience that NASA's having with the X-57 Maxwell program, they've been going through a, a tremendously difficult development process and in fact had to, uh, to put about a year's delay into the program because their first set of battery packs simply weren't safe. So uh, they've now settled on a battery pack configuration which is considerably less energy dense than you can even get in your Tesla Model S today. 
And that's a real problem because I did an engineering study and said, how good do battery packs need to be to get to the point where that electric airplane is as good as my old antique on the left-hand side of that last uh, page? And the answer is 350 watt hours per kilogram. And that's a number that's been validated by a number of people as being in about the right ballpark for where the battery technology needs to get to really enable a, a breakthrough. And um, I, I see in the short term, it's gonna be tough to get much past about the 150 level. And we'll show a little chart on history about that in the next page. Um, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this 6% per year improvement in batteries. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people around the world, uh, especially with scientists at the Fraunhofer Institute in, uh, in Germany, who have done a lot of fundamental research on battery chemistry. And they are a little bit less optimistic than that. They, they understand how long it takes to go from uh, a small sample in the laboratory that works to a commercialized battery that you and I can go out and buy in volume for our electric airplane project. Uh, let me see, what happened? Let's go straight to this one. So a little bit of history on this. So I've, I've been coming to these uh, presentations for a better part of 15 years now. Uh, in fact, I wrote an article many years ago for Willie for his magazine about electric aircraft and I've been tracking the progress of different battery packs ever since then. You know, starting back with the first electric flight in modern times in 1975. And you can see that it's been progressing pretty steadily at about a 3% per year improvement when you look at the entire battery pack system. And when you take a look at the Tesla Model 3, which is really the state of the art in terms of battery chemistry, battery packaging, uh, mass production and cost, it comes in at about 170 to 180, although nobody really knows because Tesla hasn't allowed anybody to actually break down one of their packs and get an actual performance measurement on it yet. But when you take a look at what it takes to get to that 350 watt hour per kilogram goal that I described, you can see that it's probably not going to happen in the next 10 years which is one of the reasons why I have been convinced that in the short term, a hybrid solution is gonna be the one that's gonna be so successful for anything that requires uh, anything other than a short range, short endurance mission. So part of the problem is, is where is the supply base for all this? Uh, there's a parallel back in the light aircraft industry in the right after World War II. You take a look at uh, the huge number of companies like uh, Cessna, Piper, Luscom, Aranka, all these people that were making new air vehicles, but what they had is a solid uh, supply base providing things like 65 horsepower Continental air, uh, engines, which were well proven and certified. Now you take a look at the situation in the electric aircraft industry and we have well over a hundred projects and in each one of those hundred projects, the majority of them are gonna try and develop and uh, certify and optimize their own electrical power system. So this is kind of an unprecedented situation and probably not one that's gonna be sustainable in the long term. So I, I think there's really gonna have to be uh, a supply base created that knows how to make things like battery packs, like uh, pilot uh, airframe interface displays that are somewhat standardized. And that's one of the reasons why I'm working with Jill on the, the Faraday aerospace idea is to create some of that basic infrastructure that could feed the rest of the industry. So, you know, if you take a look at a, a comparison between electric and gasoline airplanes. It gives you another idea of the, the mountain that we have to climb in terms of battery performance. You know, this is, uh, for my airplane, quite a typical mission where, uh, in fact, last summer, Jill and I uh, climbed into my airplane and we flew from my home in Bremerton, Washington up to the San Juan Islands and we had a, a nice lunch there and then turned around and came back an hour later. And 
so if you take a look at the number of, of kilowatt hours that are required to do that mission in an electric aircraft, I actually uh, took some of the data from, uh, from Tine at, at Pipistrelle. You've probably all seen the, uh, the videos that he shows with the uh, Alpha Electro. And one of the nice things about those videos is that you can see in the video exactly how many kilowatts of power that airplane is pulling in the various uh, flight regimes like takeoff, climb, cruise. So we have a pretty good idea of what's required for a modern airplane. And what it adds up to is 42 kilowatt hours. And at today's state of the art, that's 577 pounds worth of battery. And that's, that's a tremendously heavy battery to try and integrate into a two-seat aircraft. So uh, if you look at the equivalent gasoline that would be used using a Rotax 912, it ends up only being about 48 pounds. And one of the things that really drives this that I think a lot of people have overlooked is that there's an FAA regulation that any time you're going on a, a cross-country flight, you have to have, when you arrive at your destination, 30 minutes worth, worth of reserve energy. And so what that means is that not only are you carrying that battery pack for your mission, but you have to carry enough battery pack to get you another 30 minutes to, in case the runway is blocked or the weather changes. Uh, and I don't see the FAA really being very willing to change that, that basic safety regulation. So it's a, it's a real challenge that has to be overcome. So we talked about uh, green and quiet. I have this discussion with Eric Lindbergh quite often because it's been his dream to come up with a very quiet electric aircraft that could be flown over national parks. And he's actually working with... Uh, a group in Florida at Embry-Riddle to come up with a very quiet uh, electric aircraft and then flying it over national parks to, to prove that it can be done. And where I disagree with him a little bit is that uh, he has always equated electric flight with quiet flight. And as I told you earlier, in, uh, in the fuel cell aircraft I, I flew, it was actually quite noisy because we didn't pay attention to the propeller design and the propeller integration. Uh, but you can see from the, the pictures at the top that there have been a couple of aircraft in the fairly recent past that are powered by six-cylinder Continental engines that were so quiet. Um, the one on the right was used in Vietnam operationally. And uh, it was said that it could fly overhead at an altitude of 300 feet and the only sound that you could hear was something that sounded like the wind rustling the leaves and the trees. And it was all down to uh, a lot of attention being paid to propeller design and propeller airframe integration. And I feel like that's a, a critical technology that's not being paid enough attention to in electric aircraft these days. At the bottom, you see the, uh, the e-genius. Uh, I took this. Uh, a photograph just like this uh, when they were competing for the Lindbergh uh, Quiet Electric Aircraft Prize. And it turns out that it was a, indeed a very quiet aircraft because they had spent a lot of time optimizing the motor speed, the propeller design, and the integration into the airframe and came up with a very nice result. So maintenance and reliability. Uh, so with a 787 at Boeing, we took a rather bold step and one that Airbus and others have not followed in so far, which is to make what we call the more electric airplane. So a lot of the systems that are traditionally hydraulically or pneumatically powered are all electric powered on, on the, the 787. And the experience there has shown that it does wonderful things for maintainability and reliability. One of the reasons we made that uh, decision on the 787 was that the feeling was that all of these traditional braking and other you know, flap deployment systems were extremely mature and they were really at the bottom of their learning curve. But with the electric systems, we were just at the very beginning of, of how to make them better. And so already with the 787, the first application, they're already better than the legacy systems and they can only get better from this point forward. Uh, operating costs, there, there's one thing that I want to point out that almost everybody uh, forgets about when they quote numbers. Uh, for instance, uh, we see extraordinarily low hourly operating costs for electric training aircraft. 
But uh, when Pipistrelle introduced their electric aircraft into California, they gave some, some numbers behind what the battery pack life and uh, replacement cost was. And if you do the math, uh, you find that the hourly operating cost strictly for the battery pack, having nothing to do with the airframe, uh, runs anywhere from 38 to $76 per hour. Uh, so this is another reason why there needs to be a robust uh, uh, supplier base who can do better. Uh, because we need to have battery packs that are good for 1,000 or 2,000 hours before replacement if you're really going to get those hourly operating costs down as low as people would like to see it for electric aircraft. So I, I think the most important element of electric power today, especially when we look at the eVTOL uh, air vehicles, is it enables the kind of airplane that we could really only dream about in the past. If you take a look at some of the pictures that were shown earlier. They had this uh, bewildering array of gearboxes and drive shafts and uh, potential fatal uh, failure modes, which are completely eliminated by uh, the concept of using distributed electric propulsion. And, uh, you know, all of those problems that prevented those concepts from being successful in the past can now be overcome uh, with electric power. And I, I think in the near term, because of the, the uh, disadvantages we have in battery performance, that this is going to end up being one of the real major drivers behind the development of electric aircraft, because it enables aircraft that simply wouldn't be uh, possible otherwise. So uh, I tried to put uh, some of the lessons I learned at Boeing into practice for electric aircraft. Because, uh, you know, we're a room full of enthusiasts. I've been enthusiastic about electric aircraft for 15 years. And enthusiasts tend to be enthusiastic in their uh, stating of performance numbers. So it's, it's not just in the electric aircraft world, it's also at, at Boeing. So when we were developing the 787, uh, as you know, we were uh, putting a bewildering number of new technologies and new ideas into practice at the same time. And one of the reasons why that program had so many difficulties when it came to the production stage is because the most optimistic outcome for each one of those technologies had been assumed and not a one of them happened. So we had to think about, well, how do we balance this kind of boundless enthusiasm with a bit of reality so our, our investors and our owners and our bosses have a better idea of what they're really getting themselves into. So what we found is that uh, because engineers tend to want to be precise people, so if you ask them how much is this electric motor going to weigh, they're going to want to do years of studies and they're going to want to get you a precise answer that's based on something that's uh, deliverable and certifiable, and they'll tell you it weighs exactly 80.34 pounds. Well, the problem is you can't wait that long when you're designing a, a new aircraft. So what we found is much easier to do is to say, for the part of the airframe that you're responsible for, the battery pack or the motor, what's the worst it could be and what's the best it could be and what do you think is the most probable outcome? And when you look at an airplane design, it's made up of a hundred different elements like that. And for each one, there's a range of possible outcomes for them. And we use this thing we call a tornado diagram. And this happens to be one that I use for one of my clients. And it, what it shows is uh, the big items at the top of the tornado are the items that have the greatest uncertainty. And so you can see, in this case, it was battery pack specific energy because there was a very wide uh, disagreement in terms of how good our battery is going to be in 2025 when we want this airplane to be in service. Now, when you stack up all these different things and you get input from all the engineering disciplines, it also does something really important. The, the items at the top of the tornado that have the greatest uncertainty that's where you ought to put your greatest research and development investment so that you reduce the uncertainty and you have a better idea in this case of what the aircraft range in miles is going to be. So uh, there's a lot of different software uh, programs you can use. There's one that I used to create this that was called Decision Advisor. 
and uh, I've found that it's a really good way to kind of balance people's natural uh, optimistic nature against the kind of more pessimistic nature of, wow, this really might not end up being as good as we think, and getting not only a, a pretty good answer on average on how we think it's going to turn out, but uh, an idea for our investors and our bosses on how good could it really be if we optimized it, and well, honestly, how badly could it end up if things like battery packs don't progress the way we think they will. So conclusions. Um, you can probably see that uh, I think the battery technology available to the general public in the next uh, 10 years is probably not going to allow an all-electric solution for vehicles that require a lot of range. They're going to be perfect for short-range applications, and I think a good hybrid design that allows for substitution of battery packs for a, a, a sustainer motor once the batteries get better is the, the best kind of architecture. I think uh, there needs to be a, a much bigger uh, development of the, uh, the OEM supplier base. I don't think the situation with a hundred different projects all trying to independently do the same thing is sustainable either from a technical or from a, a business standpoint. So I, I really hope to see that uh, develop over the years. Uh, I think the principal advantage of electric power is going to be those unusual configurations that are enabled by the electric motors. And uh, I, I think quiet electric flight is going to require a lot more attention to quiet propeller design and propeller integration. And I have to say, it's, it's one of the subjects I almost never hear mentioned in these symposia. And I would, you know, for next year, I would love to see somebody talk about quiet propeller design as a critical element for making this happen. Um, I also think that using tools like a tornado diagram or a decision advisor software is a much better way of communicating to the public and to your investors and to your management how well or how badly uh, a project could really end up being. And back to my first lesson is uh, that I learned at Boeing is that Enthusiasm and positive thought cannot overcome the laws of physics, so good engineering is always going to be required. So, thank you very much. Oh, and a couple of things at the end. So, uh, we're here at, at EAA Oshkosh, which is where people experiment with things, and I think it's one of the beauties of, of the EAA is it's full of people who are out there doing things. So, I, I have a couple of ideas, and one of them I can attribute to Bert Rutan, because uh, he was the featured speaker at an electric aircraft symposium here in uh, Oshkosh, I don't know, five years ago, maybe four years ago. Uh, and he suggested something that I thought was kind of interesting is you see all kinds of crazy aerobatic airplanes. Like this week at, at AirVenture, we're going to see uh, where a guy has joined two Yak-55s together and put a jet engine under it. And what Bert said, yeah, it's crazy. What, what Bert suggested is, you know, we talk about distributed electro propulsion, and what he was envisioning is, think about a, a competition aerobatic airplane where you don't just have one propeller in the front, you have propellers all over the place, and they, they perform a flight control function as well as propulsion. So what would that look like? So my first idea is this airplane, which... I kind of describe it as being like a 21st century version of the fly baby. You know, it was an airplane back in the 1960s that was a winner of an EAA design contest, and EAA chapters all over the world built them. And I, I think this would be a really cool little airplane, and I've talked to people like Tina at Pipistrel about stealing some of the elements from his airplanes, like the wings and the tail, and building a, a little hybrid electric uh, testbed airplane around it. And it would use this kind of an arrangement. And uh, the beauty of something like this is it's really kind of a, a, an airplane that has twin engine safety with a single propeller. And it, it uh, can also use non-certified uh, sustainer engines. Because you know, if, if you're going to end up with a hybrid system with an elect electric motor and uh, an internal combustion sustainer motor, you want that sustainer motor to be as cheap as possible. So I came up with an idea that was an absolute minimum part count 
hybrid where you could run electric only, hybrid plus sustainer, you could uh, run with a sustainer only simply by opening and closing the, the clutch on the, uh, the motorcycle engine in this case. So, so here's a sketch that I started with the other day and you look down in, in the corner and you see a typical high performance aerobatic aircraft and so Siemens has taken this one step further and they put a big electric motor on an airplane like that. But I was thinking, well, what was Bert talking about when he, he talked about this uh, extreme aerobatic airplane? Well, how about an airplane that has uh, electric motors all over the place? So uh, for yaw and pitch control, you're not just depending on aerodynamic surfaces, but you have something that looks like a Finestron, which is a well-established aerodynamic device on, on uh, helicopters. Why not have an electric motor powered version of that that provides you uh, not only yaw, but, but pitch control? And then if you really want to get crazy, why not have some tip motors that rotate so you could do aerobatics that, that are simply beyond what anybody can imagine, you know, being able to do tumbling or cartwheel maneuvers at will. So I, I really look forward to the day when somebody is going to be crazy enough to try something like this and, and see how you can really integrate uh, the use of electric motors for flight controls in addition to propulsion. So that's my presentation. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Roger Gerson from Cummins. Michael, what makes you think that the tier ones in the aerospace industry are not interested in developing electric drivetrains, batteries, motors, and the like? People like United Technologies and others have expressed publicly that they intend to go there. Um, they are, and one of the things I learned in working in Boeing is that, uh, you know, think, think about Boeing and what they're profitable at doing. So Boeing is really profitable making airliners that are 150 seats to, to 500 seats. So I believe they're quite interested for their own purposes in things like hybrid drivetrains to service that part of the market that they're profitable at. I don't think there's going to be, you know, even look at Siemens as an example. Uh, they've spent a lot of money to develop electric drivetrains and when I talked to Dr. Anton about the pricing for those drivetrain components, uh, the numbers are so big they'll, they'll, they'll make you really wonder how anybody can afford that because it's, it's pricing that's according to what the kind of tier one OEMs would like. What, what I see the need for is uh, kind of a tier two OEM that's gonna be able to service the needs of much smaller players. Some of these hundred uh, startups out there that would like to have little airplanes and I don't think the solution in the end that the Siemens and the United Technologies of the world is going to be at a price point that those hundred people can really afford to operate at. So it's, it's the lower end of the market that I think really needs to be developed. Sure. Other questions? All right. So I've got, I've got one. Okay. With all of your enthusiasm, why are you flying a plane without any electric in it? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I never said I was going to be consistent, right? Yeah. Um, so actually, what I, what I love about my airplane is the simplicity of it. So think about it. It's a 1946 airplane, has no starter, no battery, no generator, no radio, no transponder, no ADSB. And, you know, there was a sports car designer uh, named Colin Chapman back in the 1960s. And he had a saying, he said, if it's not there, it won't break. So what I have is the ultimate embodiment of that is I have an airplane that has so little on it, there's, there's very little to go wrong. So I, I like to rub it in with my friends who all have bonanzas because, so I told you that Jill and I took a flight from Bremerton to the San Juans to get a meal. So quite often we fly in formation with me with my little slow airplane and them and their bonanzas with all of their beautiful avionics. And usually they only get to uh, the destination about five minutes earlier than I do because 
I get my airplane strap in, prop the engine, and I'm off. And they're taxing at the end of the runway, and they're checking, uh, they're checking their avionics, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And I'm halfway to the San Juans by the time they even get off the runway. And it's because of that simplicity. And so that's, I think, consistent with where I see electric aircraft being is if you have a well-crafted air, electric aircraft that's similar to my champ, it would be the most beautifully simplistic architecture you can ever imagine. There's virtually no moving parts, nothing to go wrong, hardly anything that needs to be maintained. It, it's kind of the dream airplane. So may not, I may not be consistent, but at least I know what I like. <laughs> Uh, I have a question which is a follow-up question on this as I think if you really think this EV tolls will be coming and especially autonomous EV toll will be coming mm -hmm. I think you will not be able to fly with your aircraft anymore because there should be some identification possibility on every aircraft moving around then uh, otherwise, the autonomous aircraft will not be able to, to recognize you. So I predict that's going to happen one day after I stop flying. Okay. <laughs> well, because, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a problem, and I think about this yeah. a lot, because uh, in the United States, uh, by 2020, every aircraft has to have ADSB if you're operating in, within 30 miles of a major airport. So people see me and, and I'm flying over downtown Seattle where I can, I can look and I can see the runways at SeaTac and they'd say, Mike, how can this possibly be legal? And it's because of this exemption that exists uh, in the FAA regulations because my airplane is so old and it never had an electrical system. So I, I joke that I say I have an ADSB system where I slide the window back and I go, here I am. <laughs> uh, but that makes me what Tom called a non-compliant aircraft. And that, that yeah. worries me a lot because I think the one thing the industry needs that nobody's developed yet is a tiny little uh, compact, low-powered ADS-B out beacon, which could be attached to every single flying thing, whether it be a UAV or a glider or a hang glider. Perhaps there is something which is interesting there because this was mentioned in uh, in uh, Cologne at this uh, symposium because mm -hmm. there was a jo Deutsche Flugsicherung, which is German air traffic control, yeah. and they have had uh, research with drones, with small drones, because on a small drone you can't put an ADS-B or a similar device, or also not even a Flarn in, in Germany, which has less than the ADS-B there. Right. And they said they developed a small thing where which they were able to, to control, to see the, uh, the drone traffic mm -hmm. over, uh, the, uh, um, over their systems, uh, which is an add-on system, and they think they could make, bring it down, so it was small enough to fit on an on a unmanned just right. toy, or a little bit bigger than toy drone. And so development like this are going on, and I think they have to be happening, be, uh, right. because like, not even, um, you're not alone there, because I'm doing hang gliding and paragliding, there is no electric system there, right. but if you want to keep on flying and want to do cross-country flying, you have to fly in areas where perhaps this EV tolls will operate. Right. So uh, my idea is there will be uh, uh, some kind of this small system which everybody has to carry. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's not the question, I think, now to say, okay, we are longer there than them. So they have to adapt to us. Right. I think if you look at all the economic power which is behind this development uh, is if we as pilots who still want to fly aircraft manually and like it want to f keep on flying like this, we have to adapt right. or you have to stop flying. Well, so that's why I asked Tom the question about whether ADSB is going to be a critical element for the operation of autonomous aircraft and, and I think it, it could be, but it would require new technology development that isn't available today. Well, I, I'm just waiting for when we have the embedded chip, and then it doesn't matter, right? That's right. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thank you.